Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola. By the generous support of the Alaska Native Health Board. And by Chugachmu. Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you native news from Alaska and the lower 48. Today we visit the Gwich'in people from Arctic Village. I'll be back with news briefs from around the state, but first here's Alaska Public Radio Network's Gary Fife with National Native News. This is National Native News. I'm Gary Fife. Interior Secretary nominee Bruce Babbitt stopped by a meeting of tribal leaders in Washington, D.C. on January 7th. He took time out from his courtesy calls to senators who sit on his confirmation committees to introduce himself and make a statement in support of tribal sovereignty. The secretary-designate said that tribal sovereignty was a fact of law that could not be debated but must be upheld. In his visit, he explained how he plans to handle Native affairs at the Interior Department calling the responsibility sacred. Senate's, uh, Babbitt's Senate confirmation hearings are scheduled for the third week of January. They'll be the first ever confirmations before the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs. He ended his informal talk saying the Bureau of Indian Affairs had been called a dismal swamp, but he intended to wrestle this demon to make it work. If you're watching the presidential inaugural festivities January 20th, be on the watch for several native faces among the crowd. Native artisans, leaders, and performers will be part of the festivities. Colorado U.S. Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell in Northern Cheyenne will be in, in the forefront of the Clinton Parade. He'll be wearing traditional Cheyenne buckskins and mounted on a favorite horse. Alaska Native Dancers, the World War II Navajo Code Talkers, and a number of tribal leaders from across the nation will also take part. Former Alaska State Legislator Willie Hensley spent a lot of time down south in Arkansas recently as part of the Clinton transition team. Hensley said he liked the spirit of the Clinton people because more Americans got a chance to participate in the formation of the administration's thinking. He concluded saying they would push the idea of using Native Americans throughout the government. The Tanana Chiefs Conference in Alaska will be looking to help Native villages in their quest for more control over the federal funding they get. They'll be conducting seminars among the rural villages to assist them in negotiating contracts with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to take over services formerly performed by the agency. Under the Self-Governance Demonstration Project, those villages will prepare their own budget categories for federal support. Exxon Valdez settlement money may be used to restore damaged subsistence resources in Prince William Sound. The native village of Chenega was one of the hardest hit in the 1989 spill. Traditional subsistence grounds for salmon and shellfish were lost due to the supertanker tragedy. Now some of the oil spill settlement money is being requested for an enhancement project to establish a salmon run for the, for the village. If the project is approved, work would begin this summer with the first harvest of fish estimated in 1996. And finally, the city of Atlanta, Georgia will play host to the 1996 Olympic Summer Games and there's some movement to get an all-native team entered as an independent national team. A group called Union or Unite Now Indian Olympic Nation is hoping for Olympic Committee acceptance. They say U.S. territories such as Puerto Rico and Guam field teams, and they should be able to also. This is National Native News, and for Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Gary Fife. Vince, this crash dummy Hall of Fame's impressive. Yeah, look. Ben Hurt. He tried to get safety belts and chariots. Ah. Alexander Graham Belt. Watson, buckle up. Watson, buckle up. Look, it's the Mona Lisa. 
Not much to smile about if people aren't buckling up. Vince, by telling people safety belts save lives, do you think we'll end up here? Let's hope so. Ludwig von Brake's broken. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. Let's take a look now at news from around the state. In Tokyak, the traditional council is calling for a complete investigation of a recent reindeer slaughter on Hagemeister Island. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recently shot 742 reindeer on that Bristol Bay Island. A fatal fire in Noatak brought an abundance of goods from families and communities in that area. The mid-December fire was believed to have been started when gasoline was used to start a wood stove. Three people were seriously injured in that fire that took the life of 47-year-old George Onelik Sr. In Kodiak, fishermen want the state to back away from a plan to close Alatak Bay to tanner crab fishing. The state fears the spread of bitter crab syndrome. It's a disease that makes crabs taste bitter and therefore unmarketable. But the Kodiak fishermen say that crabbing at Alatak won't increase the chances of this disease spread. And in Barrow, a man missing for several days while on a snow machine trip has turned up safe in Wainwright. Simeon Akpik Sr. was reported missing after leaving Monday on a 60-mile run from Barrow to his home in Atkasuk. Searchers spotted his sled, but there was no sign of him. Officials say that after a blizzard moved through, temperatures rose to about 25 degrees above. Search and rescue officials say Akpik managed to make his way to Wainwright on Thursday. Wainwright is 90 miles southwest of Barrow. Now let's take a look at a potluck and pelican. The Max and Paddock family clan held a potluck at the Pelican Community Hall. The 100 or so extended family and friends braved the minus 30 degrees wind chill to attend the holiday dinner. Grandpa Joseph Paddock is the elder of the Max Paddock clan, four generations of family members at the local potluck. Grandpa Joe was a forefather of the community of Pelican. Pelican is located in southeast Alaska on Chichigoff Island near Glacier Bay National Park. We go now to an interview from Alaska Native Health Board, tips on how to avoid injury. Hi, I'm Ann Walker with Heartbeat Alaska. I'm the Executive Director for Alaska Native Health Board. Today I'm talking with Helen Haynes who has a master's degree in education from Harvard she is a certified health education specialist and particularly today um, we want to talk about her experience and what she knows because she is an injury prevention specialist. Helen, why should we be concerned about injury? Injuries in Alaska are becoming a real big problem for Alaska Native people. In fact, Alaska Native people are injured at a rate of three times that of the non-native non -native population. Helen, what, is, what are injuries and, and why are we talking about injuries? I thought that accidents used to be the leading cause of, of hospitalization and death among Alaska Natives. The terminology got changed, oh, probably 10 years ago. People always talked about accidents. Well, an accident is something that can not be prevented. If you're walking under a tree and an apple falls down, well, you couldn't really prevent that. But there are injuries that are happening to people that can be prevented. Uh, drownings can be prevented if people will wear a float coat. Um, crashing into a tree on your snow machine is preventable. That's not an accident. And, and that's the difference between an um, unintentional injury and what people refer to as accidents. What, what impacts um, do injuries have on our health system and, and on native people and, and the way that we um, allocate our resources for uh, health? It really does um, drain the health dollars that are available for Alaska Native people. It is the second leading cause of hospitalizations right behind deliveries. So there's a long length of stay, um, more people are hospitalized for their injuries and that takes up 
a lot of the money. And is anybody doing anything about injuries? We're trying. Um, Indian Health Service and the health corporations are in partnership to have injury prevention programs. For example, YKHC has a float coat program and I believe they sold like 300 in one season to people by being real aggressive and, and promoting it. And in fact, um, this past year, it's been documented that the float coats have saved 16 lives just by people using those float coats. Um, the health corporations, most of them have an injury prevention program, TCC, SEARCH, um, YKHC, um, I'm thinking South Central Foundation, almost all of them have an injury prevention program. And so if the people are interested, you know, they can contact their health corporation. Let's talk about two things specifically. Um, we've been hearing a lot over the holidays about some of the injuries and deaths caused by snow machines and fires. Are there specific things that Native people, people in rural Alaska can do to prevent these injuries and uh, deaths from these two items? Absolutely. There are smoke detectors which work really well even if you have a wood stove. There's, they're, they're designed a little bit differently and so you can use them in your home even if a wood stove is your only source of heat. And putting them up and checking the batteries and just using it can, can save a lot of lives. And the other thing, of course, is with snow machines to use a helmet that prevents head injury in case there is a crash. And the other thing, too, is um, drinking and driving applies to snow machines and four-wheelers just as much as it does to cars. This sound can be a lifesaver, but it won't do you any good if fire blocks your way out. A smoke detector can warn you of a fire in your home in time to save the lives of your family. But if you're trapped, the results can be fatal. Make sure you have two ways out of every room in your house and make a home fire escape plan. Be sure your whole family knows how to use it. This message was brought to you by the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation as part of the National Community Volunteer Fire Safety Project. Families are a work of art. They come in all sizes, shapes, and colors each equally important and vital to a prosperous community. Anchorage Center for Families is celebrating its 20th year of strengthening families with comprehensive programs like Intermission Crisis Nursery, Parenting Skills Classes, and the Family Wellness Newsletter. We're here because of the generosity of the people of Anchorage. Thank you. And here's to healthy, happy families everywhere. the arts season in Alaska and University of Alaska Anchorage announces auditions for a Canadian play. The Ecstasy of Rita Joe, directed by Diane Benson auditions January 12th and 13th 7 p.m. at the UAA Arts Building room 129. There's roles for six women and 13 men and anyone with musical abilities that can play a flute, a fiddle or drums. Michael Hood encourages all to audition of all ages, gender and persuasion and also to attend the University of Alaska. I think what I want to do is to make people aware that there is a place here for the Native student. We want Native students here. I would love, uh, as you know, I would love to have the funding to have uh, a Native teacher of professional stature working with Native students here uh, in the theater program. I want to encourage Native students to investigate the theater. Uh, I think that there's a, a wealth of wisdom and of understanding that uh, I would like to see our cultures uh, share with one another. I'd like to see all the cultures represented, and we have many cultures represented in Alaska. Once again, auditions for The Ecstasy of Rita Joe are January 12th and 13th at 7 p.m., room 129 at the University of Alaska Anchorage Arts Building. We turn now to the northernmost Indian village in Alaska, Arctic Village, and visit with the Caribou people.
On the edge of the Brooks Range, 110 miles above the Arctic Circle, in Alaska, Arctic Village is tucked into the Chandelar River Valley. The 140 people who live here are Athabascan Indians, the Gwich'in. Arctic Village is the northernmost Indian village in the world and one of the last to be touched by Western culture. It is a place where people still live a simple and peaceful life in harmony with nature. The people of Arctic Village have decided that the best way to keep their traditional culture alive is to invite in new cultures, to observe, to learn, to participate as tourists. Tourists are already landing at the village airport in order to catch their flight into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now they will be invited into the village to experience the Gwich'in way of life firsthand. Many years ago when I was a kid, uh, the way that we hunt and the way we fish and dry meat and dry fish for the winter, we're still doing that. And moccasins from the caribou skins and all that stuff. So we can show all these to the tourists. We still live off the land, we still got our language, and uh, we still do a lot. Uh, most of our diet is from wild animals. 75% of our diet is wild animals. Most of it include uh, porcupine caribou herd. The porcupine caribou herd, 180,000 strong, migrate from Western Canada through the nearby Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. The Gwich'in have relied on this herd for thousands of years for food, tools, and clothing. There's, there's connection with the people because people still live off the land and protecting the land and in return they'll take care of us and that's what's going on in the Gwich'in country. Most of the people in Arctic Village still have a subsistence way of life. They still hunt and fish for their food but their need for cash has increased with their use of motorized boats, snowmobiles, and four-wheelers. There are no roads into the village, but they have television now and well-stocked grocery stores and daily flights to Fairbanks. Still, the pace is slow, and life is rich, even though there is little money. I believe in the Father I believe in the sun, and I believe in the Holy Ghost. May our people have a very strong faith. How strong you believe is a, is a very strong part of your of your survival. And our people have a I have a hard time believing in money. So see, out here, it's impractical. Get out in the woods and you get in trouble. All the money in the world is not going to save you. It, it won't even burn good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're relying on yourself. With money, it's not like that. You're relying on everybody else except yourself. It's a, it's a very different concept. One of the guys come to me and say that, um, say something about you want more developments and more jobs and more money. Why did you, you don't want that live that way here? You're so poor. Well, what did they mean? I don't understand what they meant when I'm poor. I'm, I'm uh, healthy and uh, not only myself, my peoples are healthy. The way we live, it's not the, that's, that's the rich life we have. And I, I know he's talking about his own culture, but I, I, I'm not agree with it. The Gwich'in feel that the tourism industry can bring some needed cash into the village economy with little impact on their traditional way of life. And we can show them how we live and what we got like the arts and crafts and all we want is uh, to make them happy. The people here are, are known for their hospitality. When people, it's, it's a pride of the people, it always has been. 
that when uh, people come to visit them, they go out of their way to make them feel at home and to entertain and feed them. There is a summer youth program for the teens in Arctic Village, teaching them the traditional dances and customs so that they can entertain the tourists and help to preserve their cultural heritage for another generation. The Gwich'in believe that they have something valuable to teach the rest of the world about respect for the elders, for the traditions, and for the environment. They still try to live as our elder used to live. Strong cultures. They taught me so many things and talked to me how to live good lives and stuff like that. And about that world too, small world. And uh, they telling us about the uh, land out there and resource. They always t tell us about not to shoot that animal you don't need, and not to sh catch a fish you don't need. And if you do that, and um, you just try to fight against the natures. Our people never put themselves above any animals or plants. We are just part of the whole, situ whole cycle, the whole situation. And so what happens to the woods, to the animals, pretty much dictates what happens to us. And us Indian people, we protect the environment and in order to take care of us, and that's the education we want to share, and we think it's important to the world. Trimble Gilbert, the chief of the village, is also the Episcopalian minister. His church services are in Gwich'in. It is part of the effort to teach the children their native language. Just like my mother told me, she taught the Indian language, but the strong word she used is shijut saltik kwinzi etak anti, that means that's my language. Son, take care of yourself out there. And no matter where I travel, I still remember it. It's getting to deep into my heart. And travelers into Arctic Village will surely remember the Gwich'in deep into their hearts. They enjoy seeing the scenery. And they, they told us about it. And all the animals they see and the fish and all that good water they drink. And, you know, they're... This is a small planet we live on now because the population is increasing. So we just try to save that small area up there for the future, not only for the native people, but the non-native, you know, to enjoy that, to see those country up there. And those kind of people, we try, we want to make them happy. Always remember us too, in a way. Friendship, you know. We have always felt in harmony with the land. Mm -hmm. 
Na tapiwa, makas fumas, akum. Help the Soil Conservation Service help our Earth. Call us today. We owe it to our children. Vince, this crash dummy Hall of Fame's impressive. Yeah, look. Ben Hurt. He tried to get safety belts and chariots. Ah. Alexander Graham Belt. Watson, buckle up. Watson, buckle up. Look, it's the Mona Lisa. Not oh. much to smile about if people aren't buckling up. Vince, by telling people safety belts save lives, do you think we'll end up here? Let's hope so. Ludwig von Brake's broken. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. We're 10 days into the new year, and we have an opportunity to get jobs done that we didn't get done in 1992. But the sad fact is most of us won't get the things done that are really important to us. Why would that be? It's almost like we're kind of out to defeat ourselves. Well, the fact is that most of us don't realize that any job worth doing is worth doing poorly. What that means, of course, is it's far better to start a job than it is to finish it. We can always come back later on and improve on what we've already done. But the choices are really these. A, do I start the job and let, leave it undone and come back and do it later on? Or do I start the job and just stay with it as long as it takes to get it done the way I want it to get it done? Well, if these are the choices, it's probably far better to just go ahead and start whatever it is we want to accomplish, realizing it may not be as good as we would like it to be. We can always come back later on and polish it up. For Heartbeat Alaska, this is Dr. Dennis Green. Thank you very much. We welcome news and commentary from your community, or if you'd like to order a VHS copy of Heartbeat Alaska, please call One Sky Productions, 800-478-3507. Thanks for joining me for another edition of Heartbeat Alaska. Please continue to send your tapes and news in to me. Really appreciate it, and as you can see, I use it on the show. Join me again in another two weeks for Native News from Alaska, the Lower 48, and now aired across Canada. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jeannie Green. See you then.